Philosophy of History, Wikipedia Article Audio Philosophy of History is the philosophical study of history and the past. Types In contemporary philosophy a distinction is made between critical philosophy of history and speculative philosophy of history. The names of these types is derived from C.D. Broad's distinction between critical philosophy and speculative philosophy. The latter studies the past itself whereas the former is the equivalent of what the philosophy of science is for nature. Premodern History Though there is some overlap between the two aspects, they can usually be distinguished. Modern professional historians tend to be skeptical about speculative philosophy of history. Cyclical and Linear History Sometimes critical philosophy of history is included under historiography. Philosophy of history should not be confused with the history of philosophy, which is the study of the development of philosophical ideas in their historical context. Sustainable History In his Poetics, Aristotle maintained the superiority of poetry over history because poetry speaks of what must or should be true rather than merely what is true. This reflects early Axial Age concerns rather than metaphysical concerns for what is. Accordingly, classical historians felt a duty to ennoble the world. In keeping with philosophy of history, it is clear that their philosophy of value imposed upon their process of writing history philosophy influenced method and hence product. The Enlightenment's Ideal of Progress Herodotus, a 5th century BCE contemporary of Socrates, broke from the Homeric tradition of passing narrative from generation to generation in his work Investigations, also known as Histories. Herodotus, regarded by some as the first systematic historian, and, later, Plutarch freely invented speeches for their historical figures and chose their historical subjects with an eye toward morally improving the reader. History was supposed to teach good examples for one to follow. The assumption that history should teach good examples influenced how writers produced history. Events of the past are just as likely to show bad examples that one should not follow, but classical historians would either not record such examples or would reinterpret them to support their assumption of history's purpose. Social Evolutionism From the classical period to the Renaissance, Historians alternated between focusing on subjects designed to improve mankind and on a devotion to fact. History was composed mainly of hagiographies of monarchs or of epic poetry describing heroic gestures during Charlemagne's first campaign to conquer the Iberian Peninsula. In the 14th century, Ibn Khaldun, who is considered one of the fathers of the philosophy of history, discussed his philosophy of history and society in detail in his Mukadima. His work represents a culmination of earlier works by medieval Islamic sociologists in the spheres of Islamic ethics, political science and historiography, such as those of Al-Farabi, Ibn Miskaway, Al-Dawani, and Nasir al-Din al-Tasi. Ibn Khaldun often criticized idle superstition and uncritical acceptance of historical data. He introduced a scientific method to the philosophy of history and he often referred to it as his new science, which is now associated with historiography. His historical method also laid the groundwork for the observation of the role of the state, communication, propaganda, and systematic bias in history. The Validity of the Great Man Theory in Historical Studies Is history predetermined? Does history have a teleological sense? Historical Accounts of Writing History By the 18th century historians had turned toward a more positivist approach focusing on fact as much as possible, 
but still with an eye on telling histories that could instruct and improve. Starting with Fustel de Cowell Angies and Theodore Momsen, historical studies began to move towards a more modern scientific form. In the Victorian era, historiographers debated less whether history was intended to improve the reader, and more on what causes turned history and how one could understand historical change. Narrative history tends to follow an assumption of linear progression, this happened, and then that happened, that happened because this happened first. Many ancient cultures held a mythical conception of history and time that was not linear. Such societies saw history as cyclical, with alternating dark and golden ages. Plato taught the concept of the great year, and other Greeks spoke of eons. Similar examples include the ancient doctrine of eternal return, which existed in ancient Egypt, the Indian religions, or the Greek Pythagoreans and the Stoics conceptions. In the works and days, Hesiod described five ages of man, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze Age, the Heroic Age, and the Iron Age, which began with the Dorian invasion. Some scholars identify just four ages, corresponding to the four metals, with the Heroic Age as a description of the Bronze Age. A four-age count would match the Vedic or Hindu ages known as the Kali, Dwapara, Trita, and Satya Yugas. According to Jainism, this world has no beginning or end but goes through cycles of upturns and downturns constantly. Many Greeks believed that just as mankind went through four stages of character during each rise and fall of history so did government. They considered democracy and monarchy as the healthy regimes of the higher ages, and oligarchy and tyranny as corrupted regimes common to the lower ages. In the East cyclical theories of history developed in China and in the Islamic world in the work of Ibn Khaldun. The story of the fall of man from the Garden of Eden in Judaism and Christianity can be seen in a similar light which would give the basis for theodicies which attempt to reconcile the existence of evil in the world with the existence of a god, providing a global explanation of history with belief in a coming messianic age. Some theodicies claimed that history had a progressive direction leading to an eschatological end, such as the apocalypse, organized by a superior power. Augustine of Hippo, Thomas Aquinas, or Bossuet in his Discourse on Universal History formulated such theodicies, but Leibniz, who coined the term theodicy, was the most famous philosopher who created a theodicy. Leibniz based his explanation on the principle of sufficient reason, which states that anything that happens, does happen for a specific reason. Thus, what man saw as evil, was in fact only an effect of his perception, if one adopted God's view, this evil event in fact only took place in the larger divine plan. Hence, theodicies explain the necessity of evil as a relative element that forms part of a larger plan of history. Leibniz's principle of sufficient reason was not, however, a gesture of fatalism. Confronted with the antique problem of future contingents, Leibniz invented the theory of composible worlds, distinguishing two types of necessity, to cope with the problem of determinism. During the Renaissance, cyclical conceptions of history would become common, illustrated by the decline of the Roman Empire. Machiavelli's discourses on Livy provide an example. The notion of empire contained in itself ascendance and decadence, as in Edward Gibbon's The History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Cyclical conceptions continued in the 19th and 20th centuries in the works of authors such as Oswald Spengler, Nikolai Danilevsky, and Paul Kennedy, who conceived the human past as a series of repetitive rises and falls. Spengler, 
like Butterfield, when writing in reaction to the carnage of the First World War of 1914-1918, believed that a civilization enters upon an era of Caesarism after its soul dies. He thought that the soul of the West was dead and that Caesarism was about to begin. The recent development of mathematical models of long-term secular socio-demographic cycles has revived interest in cyclical theories of history by Andrei Korotayev etal. Sustainable history and the dignity of man is a philosophy of history proposed by Nayef al-Radan, where history is defined as a durable progressive trajectory in which the quality of life on this planet or all other planets is premised on the guarantee of human dignity for all at all times under all circumstances. This theory views history as a linear progression propelled by good governance, which is, in turn, to be achieved through balancing the emotional, amoral, and egoistic elements of human nature with the human dignity needs of reason, security, human rights, accountability, transparency, justice, opportunity, innovation, and inclusiveness. Human dignity lies at the heart of this theory and is paramount for ensuring the sustainable history of humankind. Among other things, human dignity means having a positive sense of self and instilling individuals with respect for the communities to which they belong. Thus, reconciling humans' predisposition for emotionally self-interested behavior with the imperatives of human dignity appears as the one of the most important challenges to global policymakers. At national level, they have to protect their citizens against violence and provide them with access to food, housing, clothes, health care, and education. Basic welfare provision and security are fundamental to ensuring human dignity. Environment and ecological considerations need to be addressed as well. Finally, cultural diversity, inclusiveness and participation at all levels, of all communities are key imperatives of human dignity. In this respect, the sustainable history philosophy challenges existing concepts of civilizations, such as Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations. Instead, it argues that human civilization should not be thought of as consisting of numerous separate and competing civilizations but rather it should be thought of collectively as only one human civilization. Within this civilization are many geocultural domains that comprise subcultures. Nayef al-Radan envisions human civilization as an ocean into which the different geocultural domains flow like rivers, the ocean model of one human civilization. At points where geocultural domains first enter the ocean of human civilization, there is likely to be a concentration or dominance of that culture. However, over time, all the rivers of geocultural domains become one. There is fluidity at the ocean's center and cultures have the opportunity to borrow between them. Under such historical conditions the most advanced forms of human enterprise can thrive and lead us to a civilizational triumph. Nevertheless. There are cases where geographical proximity of various cultures can also lead to friction and conflict. Nayef al Radan concludes that within an increasingly globalized, interconnected, and interdependent world, human dignity cannot be ensured globally and in a sustainable way through sole national means. A genuine global effort is required to meet the minimum criteria of human dignity globally. Areas such as conflict prevention, socio-economic justice, gender equality, protection of human rights, environmental protection require a holistic approach and a common action. During the Aufklärung, or Enlightenment, history began to be seen as both linear and irreversible. Condorcet's interpretations of the various stages of humanity or Augusta Comte's positivism were one of the most important formulations of such conceptions of history, 
which trusted social progress. As in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Emile treatise on education, the Aufklärung conceived the human species as perfectible, human nature could be infinitely developed through a well-thought pedagogy. In what is enlightenment, Immanuel Kant defined the Aufklärung as the capacity to think by oneself, without referring to an exterior authority, be it a prince or tradition. Enlightenment is when a person leaves behind a state of immaturity and dependence for which they themselves were responsible. Immaturity and dependence are the inability to use one's own intellect without the direction of another. One is responsible for this immaturity and dependence, if its cause is not a lack of intelligence or education, but a lack of determination and courage to think without the direction of another. Sapara Ode Dare to know Is therefore the slogan of the Enlightenment. In a paradoxical way, Kant supported in the same time enlightened despotism as a way of leading humanity towards its autonomy. He had conceived the process of history in his short treaty idea for a universal history with a cosmopolitan purpose. On one hand, enlightened despotism was to lead nations toward their liberation, and progress was thus inscribed in the scheme of history, on the other hand, liberation could only be acquired by a singular gesture, Sapara Ode. Thus, Autonomy ultimately relied on the individual's determination and courage to think without the direction of another. After Kant, Hegel developed a complex theodicy in the phenomenology of spirit, which based its conception of history on dialectics, the negative was conceived by Hegel as the motor of history. Hegel argued that history is a constant process of dialectic clash, with each thesis encountering an opposing idea or event antithesis. The clash of both was superated in the synthesis, a conjunction that conserved the contradiction between thesis and its antithesis while sublating it. As Marx famously explained afterwards, concretely that meant that if Louis XVI's monarchic rule in France was seen as the thesis, the French Revolution could be seen as its antithesis. However, both were sublated in Napoleon, who reconciled the revolution with the Ancien Regime, he conserved the change. Hegel thought that reason accomplished itself, through this dialectical scheme, in history. Through labor, man transformed nature so he could recognize himself in it, he made it his home. Thus, reason spiritualized nature. Roads, fields, fences, and all the modern infrastructure in which we live is the result of this spiritualization of nature. Hegel thus explained social progress as the result of the labor of reason in history. However, this dialectical reading of history involved, of course, contradiction, so history was also conceived of as constantly conflicting. Hegel theorized this in his famous dialectic of the Lord and the Bondsman. According to Hegel One more word about giving instruction as to what the world ought to be. Philosophy in any case always comes on the scene too late to give it. When philosophy paints its grey in grey, then has a shape of life grown old. By philosophies grey in grey it cannot be rejuvenated but only understood. The owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the falling of the dusk. Thus, philosophy was to explain Geschicht afterward. Philosophy is always late, it is only an interpretation of what is rational in the real end, according to Hegel, only what is recognized as rational is real. This idealist understanding of philosophy as interpretation was famously challenged by Karl Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach, philosophers have hitherto only interpreted the world in various ways, the point, however, is to change it. Inspired by the Enlightenment's ideal of progress, 
social evolutionism became a popular conception in the 19th century. Augusta Comte's positivist conception of history, which he divided into the theological stage, the metaphysical stage and the positivist stage, brought upon by modern science, was one of the most influential doctrines of progress. The Whig interpretation of history, as it was later called, associated with scholars of the Victorian and Edwardian eras in Britain, such as Henry Maine or Thomas Macaulay, gives an example of such influence, by looking at human history as progress from savagery and ignorance toward peace, prosperity, and science. Maine described the direction of progress as from status to contract, from a world in which a child's whole life is predetermined by the circumstances of his birth, toward one of mobility and choice. The publication of Darwin's The Origin of Species in 1859 introduced human evolution. However, it was quickly transposed from its original biological field to the social field, and social Darwinism theories. Herbert Spencer, who coined the term survival of the fittest, or Lewis Henry Morgan in ancient society developed evolutionist theories independent from Darwin's works, which would be later interpreted as social Darwinism. These 19th century unilineal evolution theories claimed that societies start out in a primitive state and gradually become more civilized over time and equated the culture and technology of Western civilization with progress. Ernst Haeckel formulated his recapitulation theory in 1867, which stated that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, the evolution of each individual reproduces the species' evolution, such as in the development of embryos. Hence, a child goes through all the steps from primitive society to modern society. This was later discredited. Haeckel did not support Darwin's theory of natural selection introduced in The Origin of Species, rather believing in a Lamarckian inheritance of acquired characteristics. Progress was not necessarily, however, positive. Arthur Gobineau's an essay on the inequality of the human races was a decadent description of the evolution of the Aryan race which was disappearing through miscegenation. Gobineau's works had a large popularity in the so-called scientific racism theories that developed during the new imperialism period. Michel Foucault's Analysis of Historical and Political Discourse After the First World War and even before Herbert Butterfield harshly criticized it, the Whig interpretation had gone out of style. The bloodletting of that conflict had indicted the whole notion of linear progress. Paul Valery famously said, We civilizations now know ourselves mortal. However, the notion itself didn't completely disappear. The End of History and the Last Man by Francis Fukuyama proposed a similar notion of progress, positing that the worldwide adoption of liberal democracies as the single accredited political system and even modality of human consciousness would represent the end of history. Fukuyama's work stems from an Kochvian reading of Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. Unlike Maurice Godlier who interprets history as a process of transformation, Tim Ingold suggests that history is a movement of autopoiesis. A key component to making sense of all of this is to simply recognize that all these issues in social evolution merely serve to support the suggestion that how one considers the nature of history will impact the interpretation and conclusions drawn about history. The critical underexplored question is less about history as content and more about history as process. In 2011 Steven Pinker wrote a history of violence and humanity from an evolutionary perspective in which he shows that violence has declined statistically over time. After Hegel, who insisted on the role of great men in history,
with his famous statement about Napoleon, I saw the spirit on his horse, Thomas Carlyle argued that history was the biography of a few central individuals, heroes, such as Oliver Cromwell or Frederick the Great, writing that the history of the world is but the biography of great men. His heroes were political and military figures, the founders, or topplers of states. His history of great men, of geniuses good and evil, sought to organize change in the advent of greatness. Explicit defenses of Carlyle's position have been rare in the late 20th century. Most philosophers of history contend that the motive forces in history can best be described only with a wider lens than the one he used for his portraits. A.C. Danto, for example, wrote of the importance of the individual in history, but extended his definition to include social individuals, defined as individuals we may provisionally characterize as containing individual human beings amongst their parts. Examples of social individuals might be social classes, national groups, religious organizations, large-scale events, large-scale social movements, etc. The great man approach to history was most popular with professional historians in the 19th century, a popular work of this school is the Encyclopedia Britannica 11th edition, which contains lengthy and detailed biographies about the great men of history. For example, to read about the Migrations period, consult the biography of Attila the Hun. After Marx's conception of a materialist history based on the class struggle, which raised attention for the first time to the importance of social factors such as economics in the unfolding of history, Herbert Spencer wrote You must admit that the genesis of the great man depends on the long series of complex influences which has produced the race in which he appears, and the social state into which that race has slowly grown before he can remake his society, his society must make him. History and Education The Annals School, founded by Lucien Febvre and Marc Bloch, were a major landmark on the shift from a history centered on individual subjects to studies concentrating in geography, economics, demography, and other social forces. Fernand Brodel's studies on the Mediterranean Sea as hero of history, Emmanuel L. E. Roy Logerie's history of climate, etc., were inspired by this school. Narrative and History History and Causality History as Propaganda, is history always written by the victors? The Judgment of History there is disagreement about the extent to which history is ultimately deterministic. Some argue that geography, economic systems, or culture prescribe the iron laws of history that decide what is to happen. Others see history as a long line of acts and accidents, big and small, each playing out its consequences until that process gets interrupted by the next. It should be noted that even determinists do not rule that, from time to time, certain cataclysmic events occur to change course of history. Their main point is, however, that such events are rare and that even apparently large shocks like wars and revolutions often have no more than temporary effects on the evolution of the society. Karl Marx is, perhaps, the most famous of the exponents of economic determinism. For him social institutions like political system, religion, and culture were merely by-products of the basic economic system. However, even he did not see history as completely deterministic. His essay The Eighteenth Brumaire of Louis Napoleon contains the most famous formulation of Marx's view of the role of the individual in history, men make their own history, but they do not make it just as they please, they do not make it under circumstances chosen by themselves, 
but under given circumstances directly encountered and inherited from the past. Theodicy claimed that history had a progressive direction leading to an eschatological end, given by a superior power. However, this transcendent teleological sense can be thought as imminent to human history itself. Hegel probably represents the epitome of teleological philosophy of history. Hegel's teleology was taken up by Francis Fukuyama in his The End of History and the Last Man. Thinkers such as Nietzsche, Michel Foucault, Althusser, or Deleuze deny any teleological sense to history, claiming that it is best characterized by discontinuities, ruptures, and various time scales, which the Annals School had demonstrated. Schools of thought influenced by Hegel also see history as progressive, but they saw, and see, progress as the outcome of a dialectic in which factors working in opposite directions are over time reconciled. History was best seen as directed by a zeitgeist, and traces of the zeitgeist could be seen by looking backward. Hegel believed that history was moving man toward civilization, and some also claim he thought that the Prussian state incarnated the end of history. In his Lessons on the History of Philosophy, he explains that each epical philosophy is in a way the whole of philosophy, it is not a subdivision of the whole but this whole itself apprehended in a specific modality. A classic example of history being written by the victors or more precisely, by the survivors would be the scarcity of unbiased information that has survived to the present about the Carthaginians. Roman historians left tales of cruelty and human sacrifice practiced by their longtime enemies, however no Carthaginian was left alive to give their side of the story. Similarly, we only have the Christian side of how Christianity came to be the dominant religion of Europe. However, we know very little about other European religions, such as paganism. We have the European version of the conquest of the Americas, with an interpretation of the native version of events only emerging to popular consciousness since the early 1980s. We have Herodotus's Greek history of the Persian Wars, but the Persian recall of the events is little known in Western culture. In many respects, the head of state may be guilty of cruelties or even simply a different way of doing things. In some societies, however, to speak of or write critically of rulers can amount to conviction of treason and death. As such, in many ways, what is left as the official record of events is oft influenced by one's desire to avoid exile or execution. However, Losers in certain time periods often have more of an impetus than the winners to write histories that comfort themselves and justify their own behavior. Examples include the historiography of the American Civil War, where it can be argued that the losers have written more history books on the subject than the winners and, until recently, dominated the national perception of history. Confederate generals such as Lee and Jackson are generally held in higher esteem than their Union counterparts. Popular films such as Cold Mountain, Gone with the Wind, and The Birth of a Nation have told the story from the Southern viewpoint. Also, despite losing the Vietnam War, the United States produces more scholarship on the war than any other country, including Vietnam. Popular history abounds with condemnations of the cruelty of African slave traders and colonists, despite the winning status of those people in their heyday. As is true of pre-Columbian populations of America, the historical record of America being discovered by Europeans is now sometimes presented as a history of invasion, exploitation, and dominance of a people who had been there before the Europeans. This reinterpretation of the historical record is called historical revisionism, which can take the form of negationism, which is the denial of genocides and crimes against humanity. <laughs>
The revision of previously accepted historical accounts is a constant process in which today's winners are tomorrow's losers, and the rise and fall of present institutions and movements influence the way historians see the past. In the same sense, the teaching, in French secondary schools, of the Algerian War of Independence and of colonialism, has been criticized by several historians, and is the subject of frequent debates. Thus, in contradiction with the February 23, 2005 law on colonialism, voted by the UM Conservative Party, historian Benjamin Stora notes that as Algerians do not appear in their indigenous conditions and their sub-citizen status, as the history of nationalist movement is never evoked, as none of the great figures of the resistance Mesalai Hatch, Fairhood Abbas emerge nor retain attention, in one word, as no one explains to students what has been colonization, we make them unable to understand why the decolonization took place. The historico-political discourse analyzed by Michel Foucault in society must be defended considered truth as the fragile product of a historical struggle, first conceptualized under the name of race struggle however, the meaning of race was different from today's biological notion, being closer to the sense of nation. Boulain Villiers, for example, was an exponent of nobility rights. He claimed that the French nobility were the racial descendants of the Franks who invaded France, and had right to power by virtue of right of conquest. He used this approach to formulate a historical thesis of the course of French political history a critique of both the monarchy and the Third Estate. Foucault regarded him as the founder of the historico-political discourse as political weapon. In Great Britain, this historico-political discourse was used by the bourgeoisie, the people, and the aristocracy as a means of struggle against the monarchy cf. Edward Koch or John Lilben. In France, Boulain Villiers, Nicolas Frerret, and then C.I.s, Augustin Thierry, and Cornot reappropriated this form of discourse. Finally, at the end of the 19th century, this discourse was incorporated by racialist biologists and eugenicists, who gave it the modern sense of race and, even more, transformed this popular discourse into a state racism. According to Foucault, Marxists also seized this discourse and took it in a different direction, transforming the essentialist notion of race into the historical notion of class struggle defined by socially structured position, capitalist or proletarian. This displacement of discourse constitutes one of the bases of Foucault's thought, discourse is not tied to the subject, rather the subject is a construction of discourse. Moreover, discourse is not the simple ideological and mirror reflection of an economical infrastructure but is a product and the battlefield of multiples forces which may not be reduced to the simple dualist contradiction of two energies. Foucault shows that what specifies this discourse from the juridical and philosophical discourse is its conception of truth. Truth is no longer absolute, it is the product of race struggle. History itself, which was traditionally the sovereign s science, the legend of his glorious feats and monument building he built monuments fought in wars and claims victory on behalf of himself which ultimately became the discourse of the people, a political stake. The subject is not any more a neutral arbitrator, judge, or legislator, as in Solon S. or Kant S. conceptions. Therefore, what became the historical subject must search in history's Führer, under the juridical codes dried blood, the multiple contingencies from which a fragile rationality temporarily finally emerged. This may be, perhaps, compared to the sophist discourse in ancient Greece. Foucault warns that it has nothing to do with Machiavelli's or Hobbes's discourse on war, for to this popular discourse, 
the sovereign is nothing more than an illusion, an instrument, or, at the best, an enemy. It is a discourse that beheads the king, any way that dispenses itself from the sovereign and that denounces it. Since Plato's Republic, civic education and instruction has had a central role in politics and the constitution of a common identity. History has thus sometimes become the target of propaganda, for example in historical revisionist attempts. Plato's insistence on the importance of education was relayed by Rousseau's Emile, or, on education, a necessary counterpart of the social contract. Public education has been seen by Republican regimes and the Enlightenment as a prerequisite of the masses progressive emancipation, as conceived by Kant and was Estauf Clarung. The creation of modern education systems, instrumental in the construction of nation-states, also passed by the elaboration of a common, national history. History textbooks are one of the many ways through which this common history was transmitted. L.E. Tour de France P.A.R. du Enfant, for example, was the Third Republic's classic textbook for elementary school, it described the story of two French children who, following the German annexation of the Alsace-Lorraine region in 1870, go on a tour de France during which they become aware of France's diversity and the existence of the various patois. In most societies, schools and curricula are controlled by governments. As such, there is always an opportunity for governments to impose. Granted, often governments in free societies serve to protect freedoms, check hate speech, and breaches of constitutional rights, but the power itself to impose is available to use the education system to influence thought of malleable minds, positively or negatively, towards truth or towards a version of truth. A recent example of the fragility of government involvement with history textbooks was the Japanese history textbook controversies. A current popular conception considers the value of narrative in the writing and experience of history. Important thinkers in this area include Paul Ricoeur, Louis Mink, W.B. Galley, and Hayden White. Some have doubted this approach because it draws fictional and historical narrative closer together and there remains a perceived fundamental bifurcation between historical and fictional narrative. In spite of this, most modern historians, such as Barbara Tuckman or David McCullough, consider narrative writing important to their approaches. The theory of narrated history holds that the structure of lived experience, and such experience narrated in both fictional and non-fictional works have in common the figuration of temporal experience. In this way, narrative has a generously encompassing ability to grasp together and integrate, into one whole and complete story the composite representations of historical experience. Lewis Mink writes that, the significance of past occurrences is understandable only as they are locatable in the ensemble of interrelationships that can be grasped only in the construction of narrative form. Marxist theorist Frederick Jameson also analyzes historical understanding this way, and writes that history is inaccessible to us except in textual form, it can be approached only by way of prior textualization. Narrative and causal approaches to history have often been contrasted or, even, opposed to one another, yet they can also be viewed as complementary. Some philosophers of history such as Arthur Danto have claimed that explanations in history and elsewhere describe not simply an event something that happens but a change. Like many practicing historians, they treat causes as intersecting actions and sets of actions which bring about larger changes, in Danto's words, to decide what are the elements which persist through a change is rather simple when treating an individual's shift in attitude, 
but it is considerably more complex and metaphysically challenging when we are interested in such a change as, say, the breakup of feudalism or the emergence of nationalism. Much of the historical debate about causes has focused on the relationship between communicative and other actions, between singular and repeated ones, and between actions, structures of action or group and institutional contexts and wider sets of conditions. John Gaddis has distinguished between exceptional and general causes and between routine and distinctive links in causal relationships, in accounting for what happened at Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. We attach greater importance to the fact that President Truman ordered the dropping of an atomic bomb than to the decision of the Army Air Force to carry out his orders. He has also pointed to the difference between immediate, intermediate, and distant causes. For his part, Christopher Lloyd puts forward four general concepts of causation used in history, the metaphysical idealist concept which asserts that the phenomena of the universe are products of or emanations from an omnipotent being or such final cause, the empiricist regularity concept, which is based on the idea of causation being a matter of constant conjunctions of events, the functional-slash-teleological-slash-consequential concept, which is goal-directed, so that goals are causes, and the realist structurist and dispositional approach, which sees relational structures and internal dispositions as the causes of phenomena. In his Society Must Be Defended, Michel Foucault posited that the victors of a social struggle use their political dominance to suppress a defeated adversary's version of historical events in favor of their own propaganda, which may go so far as historical revisionism. Nations adopting such an approach would likely fashion a universal theory of history, a manifest destiny in the USA, to support their aims, with the teleological and deterministic philosophy of history used to justify the inevitableness and rightness of their victories. Wolfgang Skyvelbus's culture of defeat took a completely different view according to him. Defeat is a major driver for the defeated to reinvent himself, while the victor confirmed in his attitudes and methods, dissatisfied by the high losses and paltry gains made, may be less creative and fall back. The concept evokes Hegel's master slave dialectics the master is dependent of the work of the slave, the slave has to take his master's and his own interests into account gets more knowledge and more insight as the master, and in realizing that the world around him was created by his own hands he may gain self-consciousness and emancipation. Skyvelbus worked on three basic examples, the South and its lost cause after the Civil War, France after the Franco-Prussian War 1870-71, and Germany following World War I Wolfgang Skyvelbus' view includes complex psychological and cultural responses of vanquished nations, from every level of society and sees a need and rise of creativity and various narratives for the defeated. Within a society Walter Benjamin believed that Marxist historians must take a radically different viewpoint from the bourgeois and idealist points of view in an attempt to create a sort of history from below, which would be able to conceive an alternative conception of history, not based, as in classical historical studies, on the philosophical and juridical discourse of sovereignty an approach that would invariably adhere to major states' points of view. Philosopher Paul Ricoeur asked instead for a plurality in history writing. We carry on several histories simultaneously, in times whose periods, crises, and pauses do not coincide. We enchain, abandon, and resume several histories, much as a chess player who plays several games at once, renewing now this one, now the another. George Orwell's 1984 is a fictional account of the manipulation of the historical record for nationalist aims and manipulation of power.
To some degree, all nations are active in the promotion of such national stories, with ethnicity, nationalism, gender, power, heroic figures, class considerations, and important national events and trends all clashing and competing within the narrative. With regard to the history of science, the introduction of new paradigms is depicted by Thomas Kuhn as the structure of scientific revolutions. Innovation in science or technology is not based on single experiments or ideas per se, but needs a supportive environment and technical achievements to allow for a change of perspective. In all sorts of science innovative concepts are often being made in parallel, and the winning concept or individual contribution depends not on the idea per se, but other aspects as supportive circumstances, personal networks, usability, or simple wording. The process may lead to format wars, which leaves losers and winners behind. The Semmelweis reflex is a metaphor for the reflex-like tendency to reject new evidence or new knowledge because it contradicts established norms, beliefs, or paradigms, Semmelweis himself being driven into insanity, but his concept prevailing after his death grew in a strong narrative of the history of medicine. In Hegel's philosophy of history, the expression Weltgeschicht ist das Weltgericht is used to assert the view that history is what judges men, their actions, and their opinions. Since the 20th century, Western historians have disavowed the aspiration to provide the judgment of history. The goals of historical judgments or interpretations are separate to those of legal judgments, that need to be formulated quickly after the events and be final. The issue of collective memory is related to the issue of the judgment of history. Related to the issue of historical judgment are those of the pretension to neutrality and objectivity. Analytical and critical philosophers of history have debated whether historians should express judgments on historical figures, or if this would infringe on their supposed role. In general, positivists and neopositivists oppose any value judgment as unscientific. 